relaxing day on the water. But sometimes, things go wrong. The blood's just coming out. How much blood does a person have in their body? True stories. I can feel its teeth rake up the back of my head and go through my hair. Up close and in your face. I just saw this massive black whale coming up. Caught on tape. You can hear the an audible smack of the fish's bill stabbing into Pete. We got a problem. <laughs> swirl around the archipelago known as the Florida Keys. Renowned for its beauty, tranquility, and solitude. But dangers lurk beneath these peaceful waters. And if the fates turn against you, life can hang in the balance. Just ask Michael Hinojosa. For him and his girlfriend, Carrie Larson, the Keys used to be a place to kayak peacefully and relax. Kayaking is definitely my favorite activity. I love the serenity of it. We could kayak all day long. We'd bring food, drinks. We were totally prepared. They stayed mostly in very shallow areas, sometimes in water just a foot deep. But on October the 16th, 2010, they saw something new in the water, a jumping fish. Because of how shiny silver it was, it reminded me of a barracuda. It was really moving in one general direction, basically towards us as it jumped out of the water. Oh, there he went again! again. After it jumped the, the third time that I saw it, it sort of disappeared. We were both scanning the horizon for it, hoping to get another glimpse of it jumping again. And the next thing I know, there was a huge explosion on my left. That fish must have hit her so hard, the only thing I could compare it to is like a car wreck if someone were walking across a highway and suddenly were hit by the car. As soon as she popped up, I saw the hole in her rib cage. I could see rib bone popping out on both sides. I could see that there was chunks of rib missing. I could see the lung popping out of her chest. I don't know anything about CPR, but I know when you have severe bleeding, you apply direct pressure. Jumping out of the water, the fish's snout had actually punched a hole in Carrie's back, breaking her rib and puncturing her lung. As she gasped for air, her left lung would push out of this gaping hole. With Carrie in mortal danger, Mike knew he needed to get help immediately. We're in water too shallow for boats. There were no homes around. No one could see us. We could see no one. Mike dialed 911. What follows is the actual call. 911, with location? Uh, yes, I've got an emergency. Uh, I'm in a kayak. Uh, a barracuda fish just jumped into the boat and hit my, my girlfriend is bleeding. We are, um, I need Coast Guard. I am north of Big Pine Key. Okay, sir, I need to know where you're going to come into. I'm not. I need you to come to me. I'm in a car. With my left hand holding her side, keeping her lung from popping out, keeping her from bleeding to death, there was no way I was going to be able to paddle with one hand. Don't move your hand. Don't... Okay, stay on the line. I'm going to transfer you to Coast Guard, okay? I'm going to remain on the line. Station Yes, I've got an emergency pine channel just north of Big Pine. North of Big Pine? I'm in Pine Channel between Cutco and Big Pine. Cudjo. Cutco, Cutco, it's just north of Big Pine. It was obvious the person I was talking to didn't know the waters well enough to find me. There are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of islands that surround the Florida Keys. The Coast Guard was searching near Cudjo Key, but Carrie and Michael were near Cutter Key, north of Big Pine Key. Yes. 
the Coast Guard assured Mike that help would arrive in 20 minutes. 20 minutes felt like two hours. I called back. I started getting more and more angry with the people on 911 as to why they weren't here yet. I'm holding her life in my hands. I've got, I'm keeping the, the, the blood and everything inside her right now. Tell me what's geographically around you. We're what? not, we're not cut, Joe. Roger, understand that, so we're heading out there right The wound now. was so bad that I was positive she was going to die before anybody could get to us. You know, I was damn near sure that you just don't bleed like that. You don't have a hole in your chest like that and, and, and live. The blood's just coming out. How much blood does a person have in their body? When the fish shattered one of her ribs, shards of bone punctured Carrie's lung, producing massive bleeding in the chest cavity. Let me, let me talk to the Carrie, who worked as an emergency medical technician or EMT, had a good idea of just how bad it was. Uh, listen to me, I'm an EMT, and if I don't get something here within the next five minutes, I don't know what you're going to find. A radio alert was answered by towboat operator Kevin Freestone. I hopped in the boat at the, my dock and came here to Dolphin Marina. At that point, the paramedic, uh, Randy Garcia, jumps in the boat with us and headed out to see if we could find and locate the kayaker. But access to the shallow kayaking areas would not be easy. Kevin's twin engine boat required a water depth of several feet. Back there in the back country, the draft are constrained as far as how deep a water you can be in. Three feet is usually a good number. I know my boat really shouldn't have been back there that day. Things were getting worse for Carrie and Michael. It had been 41 minutes since they first contacted 911. Time was completely running out on us. We were near sunset. We were going to run out of daylight. While we were going north, the Coast Guard did come back. I guess they got a, a cell phone triangulation, and they give us a general GPS location, which kind of give me about the same feeling as where I thought they may be. But Kevin worried that his boat might get stuck in the shallow water. The tides were very low, which means that there's a lot of uh, real estate poking out of the water out there. So it's so shallow, if I came off a plane, I would never get back up again. Michael placed a final call to 911. A few minutes later, he spoke directly with Kevin on the rescue boat. I said, Captain, you need to get here as fast as you possibly can. She's bleeding to death. She's got a punctured lung. Today's the day you're going to save a life. As I'm going across that flat, my motor started knocking due to an over rev. We had them trimmed up so high, we were over revving the motors and blew the engine. But kept it going because if we'd have fell, you know, dropped down off a plane, we'd have been in the muck and would never have got there. I could hear his engines racing up, and the next thing I know, I saw him come into our field division, and he let me know that he spotted us and he was on his way. We pulled alongside of her. Our motors sank in the muck about two feet. So our, my boat was disabled at that point. When they pulled up, they were in shock as to what they found. They didn't realize the gravity of the situation, the damage that had been done to Carrie. With the towboat mired in the weeds, they still had to get Carrie back to shore. Kevin radioed for a flat bottom boat to help in the rescue. Within three, four minutes, we could see the Carolina skiff coming up to us. As soon as they had her stabilized, Kevin took off full throttle. The return trip added another 20 minutes to Carrie's desperate situation. Sector Key West, Sector Key West, come on. Finally, more than an hour after Michael had called 911, they reached the shore. When we pulled up to the dock, and I see like a dozen personnel there, I just kind of staggered back out of the way and just kind of fell apart. As the medevac helicopter took carry north to a trauma center in Miami, Michael was convinced he would never see her again. I just still believe that it was too late. Too much time had passed. Nobody loses that much blood and still survives. Against all odds, Carrie pulled through. 
she remained in the hospital for nine days. While I was in the hospital, the surgeon came in and explained to me how he had to remove a large section of the rib because it was shards in my body that he was picking out. The surgeon told me there's 20 documented cases in the history of medical journals, this sort of thing. She's missing this rib right here. So there's torn muscles and tendons and nerves and everything right in this area. The fish had jumped in a high arc to get over the back of the kayak seat and essentially stabbed Carrie. Her injury was described as a puncture wound. Why would a fish act like this? And what kind of fish could inflict such a devastating injury? Carrie and Michael had identified it as a barracuda, but Dr. Ray Wilson, a professor of marine biology, doubts that a barracuda could have caused this type of puncture wound. I have a head here of a great barracuda from, from a reef area, showing it's got pretty intimidating teeth, but it's got a blunt snout. So to puncture with a snout like this, I think would be fairly difficult. But there's another type of fish that lives in the same area called a hound fish, and has a very long snout. And these fish can get to be up to five feet long and launch from the water with some pretty good speed. Carrie's experience is very similar to another attack that also took place near Big Pine Key back in the year 2000. Stephanie Mittler was standing in shallow water when a fish leapt up and struck her in the neck. She required 27 stitches. A bony bill broke off in the wound, later identified as part of a houndfish. Houndfish tend to leap out of the water when attacked or startled. I mean, it could be mistaken for a barracuda if you didn't get a good look because it's long and slender, big fish, fins toward the back the way a barracuda has. or houndfish, Carrie was severely injured and is lucky to be alive. I'm just glad things turned out the way they did. I'm glad that she's alive and it's changed my life. It's changed who I am. It, it, it made me realize what's important and what's important is the person closest to you. Next, two doctors come face to face with a great white. The shark was fully inside the cage. I'm just thinking, it's over. And they're yelling, get him out, get him out, get him out. And later, a 136 kilogram marlin makes a terrifying leap. The marlin jumped right into the starboard side of the boat. Diving with great whites is not for the faint of heart. Even from within the safety of a cage, it's a dangerous, adrenaline-pumping experience. Big, large sharks are just so graceful in the water, it's just breathtaking to watch them, especially when they come in close. Having one of these great whites pass by you within two or three feet, you just don't realize how big 16 feet a shark is until all you see is the body of the shark passing by you. Shark cages are constructed of high-grade aluminium and can weigh over 100 kilograms. But as Patrick Walsh and Paul Damgaard discovered, sometimes they're no match than a 107-kilogram of what? Cage diving off Guadalupe Island in 2007, the two men found out just how powerful these magnificent creatures can be. Guadalupe, a small island 150 miles from the coast of Mexico's Baja California, is one of the best places in the world to see great whites in their natural environment. Neither Paul nor Patrick had ever dived with great whites before. Getting up close and personal with these giant predators was a new experience for both of them. Well, I've always been fascinated with sharks. It's been diving for maybe about a year and a half before I got the opportunity to dive in this type of environment with really big sharks. That, you know, I dove with reef sharks and other smaller sharks, but never really had an opportunity to dive with the big boys. 
And these sharks ranged in size between 14 and 18 feet in length. So these were massive sharks. One of the largest was a huge female the crew had nicknamed CC. CC was a, a large female. She was about 16 feet in length. They estimate about 2,000 pounds. Definitely full of muscle and power. Great whites attack their prey by ambush, rocketing from deep below. That day, CC suddenly went for the hang bait outside the cage that the crew was using to attract the sharks. She was probably about 300 feet down when I saw her, and uh, she was coming straight up. and just slammed straight into the viewing window where we were filming. As soon as it hit the cage, I actually screamed out. All hell broke loose. It ran right straight in through the viewing port, knocked me and my camera back to the back of the cage. I got off to one side, my camera was pushed up against the shark's head, and then it kind of released for a moment. I was able to duck underneath the shark, and as I was heading towards the other end of the cage, I could see it reposition itself, and then it started a torquing motion, and it, it snapped all the welds on top of the cage, on the front part. And that part collapsed right against me, and I wasn't able to move at that time. Looking back on it now, what I'm more surprised with is that we both didn't get crushed to death inside this cage. I mean, it just bent these bars like they were made out of toothpicks. The mangled cage sank to the ocean floor. With the shark now in the cage, the two divers desperately tried to escape. But their air hooks, or hooker line, which fed them oxygen from the boat deck, was tangled in the cage. I'm stuck. I can't get out the escape hatch. My hooker line is caught somewhere in there. This shark was fully inside the cage. <laughs> At that point, I'm, I'm just thinking, it's over. I was terrified. I just knew with 100% certainty that this was gonna be the end. And they're yelling, get him out, get him out, get him out. And all of a sudden, Cece lets up and, and starts torquing out towards the outside. And the dive master is able to just pull me up enough and the shark coming for my legs, and I'd just be able to squinch up enough, and i just ride right over the top of this shark. With Paul now safely on deck, Patrick tried to resurface, but due to his 27 kilograms of dive weight, he began to quickly sink to the bottom. I just immediately start sinking like a stone to the bottom of the ocean. I sank down below the cage so much that I couldn't reach the cage anymore. But Patrick's hooker line was still entangled in the shark cage. In order to get back on deck, he would need to go back into the cage. The crew is pulling on my hookah line, and they were able to actually pull me up close enough so I could reach the, the cage again. Once I got back into the cage, I mean, I literally sprung out of the water. There was no stopping me from, from getting back on, onto deck. You know, we're both sitting there, you know, trying to catch our breath and get the adrenaline rush down. And we look at each other and say, Is your, did you get that on the camera? Paul Damgard and Patrick Walsh were lucky. They walked away on that. For Paul, this was close enough. Well, this is the one and only cage dive that I've been on. You know, I, I didn't see going back and doing it a second time. I think I got just about all that I wanted out of that one dive. I haven't had an experience like this. The closest thing that I've had to this is being in an automobile out of control. But nothing like this where you have a 2,000 pound shark inches behind you just thrashing. But Patrick is still fascinated with these apex predators. I do still cage dive, love sharks. In fact, I was back in the water 15 minutes after this accident happened. Next, 
An ordinary dive takes a deadly turn when an aquatic giant gets a bit too playful. And later, a massive right whale jumps out of the water and onto a passing sailboat. the giants of the pinnipeds, a group of aquatic animals that include seals and sea lions. They're the largest of the seals, actually. They can get up to 15 feet long and weigh up to 4,000 pounds. And although they may appear to be slow and longer on land, when they get in the water, they're as nimble as dolphins. These supersized seals are usually docile, but they can become quite aggressive, as two underwater cameramen discovered firsthand. Florian Greiner and Seth Schulberg were shooting a documentary on sea lions in the Sea of Cortez, near La Paz, Mexico. So we were on assignment to film the sea lions. Seth was basically my buddy looking for diving safety and helping me with the shots. So we were there as a team trying to film the sea lions. And all of a sudden, completely out of the blue came this elephant seal and it just came straight at me and just grabbed my head. I was really scared. I felt my heart pounding. For all I knew, it could just take my head off. All of a sudden, the elephant seal let go and I was just looking at its face and you know, I was just catching my breath again and boom, he came again and grabbed my head again felt like a steel bite. He probably held on to me for half a minute, maybe close to a minute. It felt like an eternity. It felt like, I, I want to get out of here. Finally, the elephant seal released Florian from its jaws. Florian and Seth called it a day, but they were intrigued by the encounter. So that evening we watched this footage and really carefully went through it. There really isn't much elephant seal footage around from underwater. And it happens very rarely that they engage with people. So this was really, really a unique moment. Tempting fate, they decided to go back the next day to get some more footage. As underwater photographers, Seth and Florian want to get the best shots of wild animals. But perhaps they may have got too close. And this time, the giant seal went for Seth. He didn't even see this elephant seal come. He just came from behind and grabbed his head. When the elephant seal opens its head, it looks like it can swallow a basketball. It looks like it can swallow my entire head. And it looked like that's what it was trying to do. And I could feel its teeth rake up the back of my head and go through my hair. Florian continued to film as the giant started to drag Seth around by his arm. In fact, at one point, it twisted my arm so badly, it felt like it was dislocating my shoulder. Then suddenly, the elephant seal tried to get even closer. He's grabbing Seth, like, face onwards, and it looked like, oh, I'm not sure where this is going. It actually occurred to us, you know, maybe he's trying to do some mating thing here. It didn't go that way. Please to say. But for several tense moments, it appeared that Seth may either be drowned or crushed. We're in very shallow water on top of rocks. And this animal is gripping me to its body, and we're rolling around, and I keep thinking, what am I going to do if it bounces me off the rock? Now, Seth had another concern. He and Florian were using special scuba gear. We're using rebreathers, not conventional scuba equipment, because rebreathers don't put out bubbles, don't make noise, and would let us stay underwater for eight hours if we wanted. The drawback is pure oxygen rebreathers confine you to about 20 feet of water. You start going much deeper than that, and oxygen becomes toxic, and by 60 feet, it would have killed you. What happens if it decides to go deep? 
just when Seth thought the worst might happen, the elephant seal released him. It finally just took off and dived away. When he let go, Seth just legged it for the boat. He was done. Marine biologists say that elephant seals rarely attack humans with the intention of hurting them. But if surprised or approached too closely, they can chase or bite people. And even a playful encounter with an animal this size could have disastrous consequences. You should never approach a large marine mammal and interact with it under any circumstances. They are not humans. Um, we don't know what's going to bother them. We don't know how to communicate with them, and they don't know how to communicate with us so to protect yourself and for the protection of the animal it's best not to have any sort of contact like that especially being that elephant seals are one of the most ferocious seals out there that's the phenomenal thing I mean you would have thought this animal being this heavy and this strong that there's a real danger that it could actually really just twist your neck off or do serious harm this thing could have easily taken our head off. The amazing thing was, he didn't. Coming up, a blue marlin turns the tables on a fisherman. Watch out! And a picture-taking session with a right whale ends in disaster. Sport fishing is the aquatic equivalent of big game hunting. And for an angler, there is no greater prize than the blue marlin. The average size of a marlin is between 300 and 500 pounds. The females get much larger. They can get up to about 1,800 pounds, which is huge for a fish. Massive creatures are cornered. They can be deadly. The most dangerous part of all marlin fishing is when a marlin's hooked and he is connected to that boat by a line. It can accelerate to 20 miles an hour instantly and it needs to go somewhere. That's where things start getting very dangerous. Marlins have spectacular fighting ability. The angler needs exceptional skill and endurance to land one. But sometimes, the tables turn, and the hunter becomes the hunted. Watch out! Pete Longo Sr. found out firsthand how risky hooking one of these huge oh, yes. fish can be. In April 2004, Pete, along with pals Don Markovich and Kevin Kemmer, traveled to Guatemala for a four-day fishing trip. Guatemala boasts some of the best sports fishing in the world. And the guys were looking forward to some excitement and adventure. Yeah. On the last day, the group was two hours out at sea on board the Captain Hook. The trip had gone well, but Pete still hadn't bagged a mile. Nice. Look at that. That morning, he finally hooked the grand prize. I wasn't paying attention until they hollered Pete. Grab that line, grab that line. So I grabbed the pole, and he was going, he was jumping all the way about 150 yards away. For the next 30 minutes, 81-year-old Pete Longo played a life and death game of tug of war. Well, he scared me. You know, he's jumping high, look, look, 200 feet away, you see that thing coming out of the water, and I'm thinking, and I got him on my pole. And then my arms are starting to get tired, and I called for Don. Let me give you a hand, buddy. And Don came over, and I said, here, Don, grab it. So he took the pole. As Don tried to wear out the marlin, the huge fish desperately struggled to free itself, resorting to a move called tail walking. He tail walked and he went under the water, then he came back up and he was tail walking again. This is when things can turn deadly. The marlins decided, hell, it's a hell of a lot better me sw swimming in the direction of the line than swimming away from it. And next thing you have a, a marlin charging for the boat. 
I remember seeing this big black menacing looking eye staring up at the boat and I could see into that eye and I knew that this fish wanted to cut in that boat and get a piece of somebody. The marlin turned around and came full steam ahead, jumped right into the starboard side of the boat, striking Pete in the back. You could hear the, an audible smack of the fish's bill. Watch out! At first, his friends didn't realize that Pete had been seriously injured. The fish was back in the water, and we still had him on. So I stayed on the fish to watch the fish go back out and continue to fight and try to shake the hook. Yeah, yeah. Right, it's not that bad. Everybody realized how bad Pete was hurt. Ah, it's well, not good. I got up on maybe about a foot and I'm looking down, and there's a big pile of blood. Oh, he's got problems. He came over the side of the boat and his bill went right into Peter's side. The Marlin's serrated bill had entered Pete's upper back on a downward angle, going in almost 15 centimeters and puncturing his lung. His buddies tried to control the bleeding, but to no avail. When I got into the cabin, Don started to pack on my back to, to stop the bleeding, and the blood was coming out pretty good. To make matters worse, Pete was on blood thinning medication, which prevented his blood from clotting. He was bleeding to death. And the Captain Hook was 90 minutes from land. It didn't look good. I realized right then and there, this guy might not make it. Finally, they reached the shore, but it was still a one and a half hour trip to the hospital on narrow two lane roads. Another half an hour, and Pete wouldn't have made it. That's how bad it was. The surgeon told Pete that he was lucky to be alive. The Marlins' bill had come within a few centimeters of his heart. You know, he said, if that thing was over another two inches, and then he said, you wouldn't be here. Both Pete and the Marlin survived their encounter. Watch out! But it could have turned out very differently for Pete. This is a very powerful creature. So would it intentionally jump into the boat and try and injure somebody? No, but if you have a fish that is struggling for its life and it's very powerful, people can probably get injured if they're too close. Pete eventually recovered and was able to resume his favorite pastime. He's still an avid fisherman, and he still wants to get the one that got away and almost did him in. We're going to go back to Guatemala someday, and I'm going to get that guy. I'll make sure I get him. Coming up, a giant whale leaves a sailboat in ruins. And while feeding tarpon, things get out of hand. <laughs> I just looked out into its open mouth. <laughs> For avid boaters Ralph Mothers and Paloma Verna, there is nothing more enjoyable than sailing in Table Bay near Cape Town, South yep. Africa. But July the 22nd, 2010, would prove to be one day that the two would not soon forget. That day, their encounter with a southern right whale turned into a real-life reenactment of Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Southern right whales frequent the coastline between Port Elizabeth and Cape Town in South Africa. They can reach up to 15 meters in length and weigh up to 40 tons, as big as a bus. It's a large baleen whale. It doesn't have a dorsal fin, and it's got callosities on its head, which make it identifiable. So it's kind of like a piece of warty skin that becomes colonized by cyamids, which is a type of whale lice, and sometimes barnacles as well. Amazingly, these bear moths can breach or jump clean out of the water. If you just think of the kind of muscles that it must take to lift 40 or more tons, 
right out of the water like that is just incredible. Why they leap out of the water is a mystery. We don't really know why they breach. It could be just to get rid of parasites. It could be a form of communication, just you know, jumping out of the water, making a loud splash and saying, here I am. And on a July day in 2010, Ralph and Paloma crossed paths with one of these giant whales. We dropped anchor and we then decided after lunch, well, let's carry on sailing. And we'd heard the slapping. We had this real banging on the water. And we saw in the distance there was a whale standing on its head and smacking its tail on the water repeatedly and then lying on the surface and then doing a head balance, slapping its tail again, then lying on the surface. It was so amazing. I mean, I've seen whales breach, but actually to be so close and to see the back of the whale coming out and then the whole tail and then him smacking the tail into the water. First time the whale breach was probably three, four hundred yards away at least. And it just suddenly just took off out of the water. It was amazing to see because we had never seen them breach here in Table Bay. Oh, wow. Did you see that? Yeah. That's awesome and so close. Yeah. Paloma was standing on the port bow near the shrouds. I just thought, well, we were sailing in one direction. He was coming at 90 degrees towards the boat. And I thought, well, if he's going to come towards us, he's going to come under the boat because they often come under the boat and pop up on the other side. So I said to Paloma, you better come on this side. And if he does, you can take the photographs on this side. I was sitting on this side busy with the camera, pointing, just looking where it was going to surface because obviously I hoped that it would maybe breach on the other side again to get a nice picture. I was just looking in the other direction when I heard him say, oh, and as I turn around. A videographer on a nearby boat happened to capture the astonishing scene on tape. I just saw this, this massive black whale coming up and hitting the mast. All I can remember is that standing here, the sky just went black in front of me. It was like the day became night. And I just saw this thing came out the water, hit the shrouds, hit the mast. The mast crag came crashing towards me. I ducked, Paloma ducked. The mast came, missed me by millimeters, landed on top of the bry here. The mast with the sails, with the sheets, with the rigging, everything just in slow motion coming towards us. I just ducked and he also ducked behind the, the steering column. It happened so fast that we actually didn't have time to get scared. And I looked down to see if we were taking on any water and I saw that there was no water floating on the boat. So I said to Ralph, we are not taking on any water. And he just said to me, stay, stay calm, go down and switch on the engine. Ralph and Paloma were lucky, and so was the right whale. Though their boat was severely damaged, they escaped without injury, and the whale swam away, apparently unharmed. Still photographs provided further proof of the encounter. If you look at that photograph now, how can anybody survive that kind of thing landing on your deck? The video went viral on the internet. The public was fascinated by this close encounter with one of the largest and most powerful animals on Earth. But what had caused the huge whale to land on Ralph and Paloma's boat? Was it deliberately trying to attack them? Or was it an accident? They didn't have engines on. And I just don't think that the whale knew that they were there. I think it's a, simply a situation where the yacht was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Though it's likely that the whale didn't mean to harm them. But Ralph and Paloma both realized that their encounter could have been a disaster. If it had come up two seconds later, it would have come out of here on top of us, we'd be dead today because it would have landed smack bang on top of us here in the cockpit. And I don't think anybody would have survived that. So we, we're lucky to be alive. Why would anyone stick their hands into the jaws of these ferocious creatures? Who is that? Oh, oh. Each 
each year, hundreds of visitors come to a marina in the Florida Keys in hopes of being attacked by large fish. And in most cases, they deserve it. They actually beg the fish to attack. And more than a few leave with some bloody evidence of their aquatic encounter. Tarpon, also known as megalops, are prized not for their meat, but for the fierce fights they put up when hooked and their huge size. Tarpon are one of the oldest living fish species. Fossils have been found dating back more than 100 million years. Found mostly in the warm regions of the Atlantic Ocean, tarpon can grow to be a few meters long and 127 kilograms. But that doesn't stop some people from wanting to hand feed these massive metallic monsters. At Robbie's Marina in Isla Morada, Florida, you can do just that. Tarpon is a very large game fish. It's in uh, the minnow family. It's basically a big old herring. People come from all over the world to try to catch them. Wonderful sport fish. They jump, they fight. And here at Robbie's, you have the opportunity to hand feed them if you want. People come in and get the bucket and go out to the end of the dock where the bigger fish are. Some people like to hand feed them. Some people like to throw them. Some people like to get their hand bit. We don't encourage that, but people come down and they just want to show off to their friends, their girlfriend and such, and they just want to feed the fish by hand. If you're not paying attention, bam, he's on you. This woman tries a little coaxing. Come on. <laughs> I just looked out into its open mouth. He's going all the way down that long arm and don't move. Don't move, don't move. And if you dangle a little snack over the water, these fish will attack. They don't know where that fish ends and your hand begins, really, you know. People are astonished at the size of the gaping tarpon moor. The lower jaw drops down and it pivots on a joint and the side bones come down and form a kind of a pipe that the tarpon can then suck uh, its prey into. They don't really have much in the way of teeth, so it's more as if they scraped the hand and produced a little bit of blood from scraping. The tarpon's huge mouth is designed to swallow its prey whole, using a bony plate in its lower jaw to crush its food. While these giant jaws do little damage, it really isn't a good idea to hand feed the tarpon. So it just takes a little skin, it's just like rough, a little more grittier than a bass. People love to do it. We just give them some peroxide, a couple band-aids, and they leave with a smile. I got that one. One nil to the top on. Here yet. I'm holding her life in my hands. I've got a keeping the, the, the blood and everything inside her right now. Tell me what's geographically around we're you. Not, we're not cut, Joe. Roger, I understand that, sir. So we're heading out the right The now. wound was okay. so bad that I was positive she was going to die before anybody could get to us. You know, I was damn near sure that you just don't bleed like that. You don't have a hole in your chest like that and, and, and live. The blood's just coming out. How much blood does a person have in their body? When the fish shattered one of her ribs, shards of bone punctured Carrie's lung, producing massive bleeding in the chest cavity. Let me, let me talk to Carrie, who worked as an emergency medical technician or EMT, had a good idea of just how bad it was. Uh, listen to me, I'm an EMT, and if I don't get something here within the next five minutes, I don't know what you're gonna find. A radio alert was answered by towboat operator Kevin Freestone. I hopped in the boat at the, my dock and came here to Dolphin Marina. And at that point, the paramedic, uh, Randy Garcia, jumped in the boat with us and headed out to see if we could find and locate the kayaker. But access to the shallow kayaking areas would not be easy. Kevin's twin-engine boat required a water depth of several feet. 
Back there in the back country, the draft are constrained as far as how deep of water you can be in. Three feet is usually a good number. I know my boat really shouldn't have been back there that day. Things were getting worse for Carrie and Michael. It had been 41. Relaxing day on the water. But sometimes things go wrong. The blood's just coming out. How much blood does a person have in their body? True stories. I can feel its teeth rake up the back of my head and go through my hair. Up close and in your face. I just saw this massive black whale coming up. Caught on tape. We got a problem. You can hear the an audible smack of the fish's bill stabbing into Pete. We got a swirl around the archipelago known as the Florida Keys. Renowned for its beauty, tranquility, and solitude. But dangers lurk beneath these peaceful waters. And if the fates turn against you, life can hang in the balance. Just ask Michael Hinojosa. For him and his girlfriend, Carrie Larson, the Keys used to be a place to kayak peacefully and relax. Kayaking is definitely my favorite activity. I love the serenity of it. We could kayak all to get help immediately. We're in water too shallow for boats. There were no homes around. No one could see us. We could see no one. Mike dialed 911. What follows is the actual call. Uh, yes, I've got an emergency. Uh, I'm in a kayak. Uh, a barracuda fish just jumped into the boat and hit my my girlfriend. Is bleeding. We are. Um, I need Coast Guard. I am north of Big Pine Key. Okay, sir. I need to know where you're going to come into. I'm not. I need you to come to me. I'm in a kayak. With my left hand holding her side, keeping her lung from popping out, keeping her from bleeding to death, there was no way I was going to be able to paddle with one hand. Okay, stay on the line. I'm going to transfer you to Coast Guard, okay? I'm going to remain on the line. Station Yes, I've got an emergency Pine Channel just north of Big Pine. North of Big Pine? Uh, in Pine Channel between Cutco and Big Pine. Cutco, Cutco, it's just north of Big Pine. It was obvious the person I was talking to didn't know the waters well enough to find me. There are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of islands that surround the Florida Keys. The Coast Guard was searching near Cudjo Key, but Carrie and Michael were near Cutter Key, north of Big Pine Key. The Coast Guard assured Mike that help would arrive in 20 minutes. 20 minutes felt like two hours. I called back. I started getting more and more angry with the people on 911 as to why they weren't. Minutes since they first contacted 911. Time was completely running out on us. We were near sunset. We were going to run out of daylight. While we were going north, the Coast Guard did come back. I guess they got a, a cell phone triangulation, and it gives a general GPS location, which kind of give me about the same feeling as where I thought they may be. But Kevin worried that his boat might get stuck in the shallow water. The tides were very low, which means that there's a lot of uh, real estate poking out of the water out there. So it's so shallow, if I came off a plane, I would never get back up again. Michael placed a final call to 911. A few minutes later, he spoke directly with Kevin on the rescue boat. I said, Captain, you need to get here as fast as you possibly can. She's bleeding to death. She's got a punctured lung. Today's the day you're going to save a life. As I'm going across that flat, my motor started knocking due to an over rev. We had them trimmed up so high, we were over revving the motors and blew the engine but kept it going because if we'd have fell, you know, dropped down off a plane, we'd have been in the muck and we'd never got there. 
I could hear his engines racing up. And the next thing I know, I saw him come into our field division. And he let me know that he spotted us, and he was on his way. We pulled alongside of her. Our motor sank in the muck about two feet. So our, my boat was disabled at that point. When they pulled up, they were in shock as to what they found. They didn't realize the gravity of the situation, the damage that had been day long. We'd bring food, drinks. We were totally prepared. They stayed mostly in very shallow areas, sometimes in water just a foot deep. But on October the 16th, 2010, they saw something new in the water, a jumping fish. Because of how shiny silver it was, it reminded me of a barracuda. It was really moving in one general direction, basically towards us as it jumped out of the water. Oh, there he went again! again. After it jumped the, the third time that I saw it, it sort of disappeared. We were both scanning the horizon for it, hoping to get another glimpse of it jumping again. And the next thing I know, there was a huge explosion on my left. That fish must have hit her so hard, the only thing I could compare it to is like a car wreck if someone were walking across a highway and suddenly were hit by the car. As soon as she popped up, I saw the hole in her rib cage. I could see rib bone popping out on both sides. I could see that there was chunks of rib missing. I could see the lung popping out of her chest. I don't know anything about CPR, but I know when you have severe bleeding, you apply direct pressure. Jumping out of the water, the fish's snout had actually punched a hole in Carrie's back, breaking a rib and puncturing her lung. As she gasped for air, her left lung would push out of this gaping hole. With Carrie in mortal danger, Mike knew 